Okay. Um, by my watch, it's time. Um, and so I think we should get started. Um, welcome everybody to uh, this session on assessing the United Nations uh, HLPE report number 15 on food security and nutrition. Uh, I'll be chairing this session. I'm Bill Mosley. I'm at McAllister College. And I'm going to present uh, as quickly as I can some highlights from the report. I was part of the author team for it. And then we have six distinguished panelists who are going to share their thoughts and uh, insights. So Garrett Grady Lovelace, who's at uh, American University. Hanson Yantaki Frimpong, who's at the University of Denver. Uh, uh, Jahi Chappelle, who's with the Southeastern African American Farmers Organic Network. Uh, Joeva Rock, who's at UC Berkeley. Carl Zimmer, who's at Penn State. And Brian Dowd Urib, who's at the University of San Francisco. So they'll each have um, up to about eight minutes, and which should leave us a good 20 minutes for general discussion afterwards ideally more if some of us are quicker. This is sort of organized in an author meets critics format, but um, to be clear, I'm not gonna be defending the report. Uh, I'm mostly interested in the discussion it generates. Um, so we'll just have a, a, a general uh, open discussion uh, at the end. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. Can everybody see that okay? All right, I'll grab my pointer here. All right. Um, so I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background. Uh, I wanna get my stopwatch going here, sorry. So I don't abuse the time, not good if you're the chair. Um, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background on HLPE and what it is. Uh, and then I'll spend most of my time talking about this particular uh, report. So I realize that some of you are probably quite familiar with this structure, others are not, right? So um, the HLPE, which is the high level panel of uh, experts on food security and nutrition was created in 2009 as a reform effort uh, at the UN to provide sort of unbiased scientific advice to this Committee on World Food Security. And the Committee on World Food Security is supposed to coordinate policy between the three Rome-based agencies that have a sort of food and agricultural mandate, the FAO, the WFP, and EFAD. And um, the members of HLPE, there are 15 of us. Um, we do not represent um, countries. We're on the committee because of our sort of academic expertise. Um, there is sort of a regional balance between different regions of the world, as well as a balance of expertise. Um, the CFS has its own sort of secretariat, and then there's a bureau that's composed of different member states. And then there's an advisory group that is composed of uh, the civil society mechanism, which is uh, a lot of people from uh, NGOs. There's a private sector mechanism, which has a sort of corporate uh, membership. Um, there's also philanthropic uh, foundations, um, uh, global financial institutions, and different uh, UN agencies. And um, this is my own bias, but I think uh, the CFS, the Committee on World Food Security is um, in many ways sort of remarkably participatory and inclusive, certainly relative to other institutions uh, in the UN. And so the CFS will make requests to HLPE for a report on a particular topic. And, um, the last thing I'll just mention is that um, we have the Global Food Summit that's coming up in the fall. There's been sort of 
a controversy swirling around this global food summit and who's defining the agenda. And a potential outcome is to sort of create a parallel structure that might displace sort of the CFS and the, and the uh, HLPE. So that might be something we want to talk about at, at some point. So um, on to talking about uh, the report. Most reports that are produced by the HLPE are, um, they sort of recruit a team of experts who write the report and then it is sort of overseen by uh, the HLPE. This particular report was a bit different uh, in that it was written in house. So Jennifer Clapp, who's at the University of Waterloo, Barbara Burlingham, who's at Massey University in New Zealand, Paula Termini, who's um, based in Rome with the HLPE Secretariat and myself were the uh, key authors of the report. And then it's, um, it goes through the committee and obviously there are lots of compromises that are made. So, you know, what we wrote originally is not what necessarily comes out uh, uh, the other end. And this report um, was not based on sort of new research. It was about um, sort of summarizing uh, past, past work that had been done uh, by the committee. And it's supposed to be very forward looking um, and sort of to develop a global vision or narrative for moving forward with an eye to SDG2 uh, on food security and, um, and making better progress toward that by, by 2030. So three key research questions, which um, are reflected in the structure of the report. Um, the first chapter is much more conceptual, talking about how, you know, what's the sort of latest thinking on food security and nutrition. The second question is looking at what are the key trends and challenges affecting food security and nutrition. And then the third question is about sort of uh, promising um, sort of policy options. So, the structure of the report really tracks with those key questions. And I'm gonna spend the most part of my time really talking about this first introductory chapter because it's, I think, most relevant to sort of academia and thinking about the concepts uh, behind food security and nutrition. And then I'll talk more quickly about the other, other sections of the report, all right? So there are three or uh, four key messages that are in this first chapter and I'll um, discuss those in turn. So prioritizing the right to food, broadening our understanding of food security, um, adopting a food system sort of analytical and policy framework, and then embracing key policy shifts, right? So um, the right to food uh, was, you know, articulated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. Uh, it's been around for a long time, but we thought it was extremely important to highlight uh, the importance of this. And um, because it's, its implementation has been highly uneven and basically re-articulate, you know, why this is so central to our thinking about uh, food security and nutrition. Then we looked at um, what is traditionally referred to as the four pillars of food security. We prefer to call them dimensions, availability, access, utilization, and stability. And we propose that a fifth and sixth dimension should be added. This is nothing new. It's been around in the academic literature, but it has not officially been endorsed in policy circles. So agency, thinking about people's capacity and social movements capacity to sort of shape the food systems that feed them. And then sustainability, thinking about the long term, which distinguishes it from stability, which is more has to do with shorter term fluctuations in, you know, food prices, food supplies. Um, I was going to say brilliant, something brilliant about that, and it just totally, totally uh, slipped my mind. Um, okay. Um, we then look at sort of the conventional definition of food security. All people at all times have um, uh, physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious dietary needs and food preferences. 
And you can see these six dimensions that are all sort of embedded in this, in this dimension, all right? So agency clearly links to all people and food preferences. Uh, sustainability clearly links to at all times. Oh, I know what I wanted to say about agency previously. It syncs up really well with food sovereignty, but we made a deliberate decision not to use food sovereignty in the report because it's sort of a politicized topic and we didn't want that to impede the adoption of, of, of agency as being a, a new official dimension of, of food security. Then we talk about these four critical policy shifts. And we talk about how historically there's been a big focus on production and we need to move towards radical sort of transformation of the food system. So we're thinking now about more diverse food production systems that produce quality food. So it's not just production. Then we argue that we need to move from food security and nutrition as a sectoral issue to one that cuts across different sectors. And uh, you know, COVID-19 is a great example of this. It's not just something to be dealt with in the Ministry of Agriculture. We have to think about the Ministry of Health. We have to think about the Ministry of Finance. It needs to be much broader than the sort of traditional silos. Uh, we need to move from this sort of exclusive focus on fighting hunger and just producing more calories to thinking about other you know, uh, issues like micronutrient deficiencies and obesity um, that are linked to poor nutrition, and then move from sort of big picture global solutions to thinking about this in specific contexts. So you know, one policy is not going to fit every, every uh, situation. So here we sort of move from um, these big shifts that need to happen. One night, there's a fifth one that I didn't mention on the previous slide, which is about enabling conditions. So you need sort of the necessary research and governance structures to make this happen. Then we move to these six dimensions and we're not just thinking about them as sort of discrete and separate, but you need to think about them as a system. And then this moves us towards achieving SDG2, uh, reducing uh, uh, hunger by 2030, right? So I'm gonna move much more so quickly now, moving into um, chapter two, which is focusing on the trends and challenges. Obviously um, we were making progress towards SDG two until a couple of years ago, and then we began backsliding. We have 840 million people who are now undernourished. Uh, this has been exacerbated by COVID-19. Uh, 1.9 billion adults who are overweight. Um, so we're sort of facing serious challenges and we delineate all these challenges. I'm not gonna go into them, into these sort of different bins, right? So, you know, COVID is under the biophysical. We also talk about pest problems like the desert locusts in East Africa. We talk about under economic and market sort of financialization and land grabs is a problem or under demographic growing urbanization trends that, that present certain challenges for food systems. And then these also track really well with these six dimensions of, of food security. And then the, the last part of the report, we discuss different policy directions and these are organized in terms of these four critical policy shifts that I talked about earlier. Um, so, you know, radical transformation of the food system. We talk about things like uh, agroecology. Uh, we talk about, we need more localized and regional markets, also known as territorial markets. Um, then we um, discuss, you know, moving to, you know, a conceptualization that cuts across different, different sectors. Uh, and then we move to thinking about hunger and nutrition, not just sort of a deficit of, of calories. Um, uh, and then the last part is sort of context specific interventions. I think COVID-19 is a classic example of how, you know, maybe lockdowns work in Europe, but they don't work very well in places with a large informal sector that can create a whole other host of, 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 of food problems. And then the last, the conclusion is where we have the um, policy recommendations, which sync very closely with the, um, the policy 
options we talked about in the previous section. And then this is the last part of the report. And again, the policy recommendations all fit into these sort of policy shift bins. All right, so I went a little bit over, um, but I'm going to stop there and uh, move to our first uh, discussant, who is Garrett. Great, thank you. There's so much there. Um, so I wanna begin firstly by greeting everyone. I'm Garrett Grady Lovelace. I'm at American University School of International Service in Washington, DC, currently at my home in Maryland in traditional Piscataway lands. And very honored to be sharing this space with you all virtually um, and learning from this important report. So I'll begin by saying gratitude to the high level panel of experts and to Professor Bill Mosley for this important intervention. It is easy to critique, and it is easy to govern status quo, but to operationalize critique into pathways for transforming governance, that's very hard, uh, but that's the goal. So I really appreciate the um, ambition of this intervention, um, but I'm going to be framing my remarks largely um, as the constructive critique. Um, kind of following the author meets critic invitation. Um, I see the HLLP report, this one is opening up space. Um, and I'm very grateful for the steps that were taken to call for a radical transformation. But I think within the context of the UN Food System Summit fail that we're seeing, which I hope we have time to talk about, I think it's all the important to go even further in transforming our very categories that we're thinking about with regard to a food system. So what I'm going to do is actually go through the report step by step with things that I thought were avenues of future, you know, going even further and then end with a few remarks on a project that I'm working on um, that could help kind of frame um, the next level of this. So in terms of timing, the timing and the urgency of this was laid out very admirably at the beginning of the report, but I would also add Black Lives Matter global uprising as an important kind of geopolitical and temporal moment that we're in um, that's really informing radical transformations or at least the urgency of having radical transformations in academia as well as agricultural systems and food systems at large. Um, so thinking about how the Black Lives Matter global uprising as well as the Indian farmer protest global uprising, which I'll talk about at the end of my remarks, I think would help us talk about the openings that are available to us right now as we think through these transformations. And in terms of another kind of timing that we're in, we're in an authoritarianist backlash to multilateral geopolitics and international liberalism. So thinking through that and what's driving the authoritarian regimes that we're in the middle of and not enabling them further with a geopolitical imaginary that kind of fixates on the head of state big man politics. Um, so in terms of the key messages of chapter one, so much was empowering here, even the term empowering, though I think actually the term empowering is part of the problem, which I want to unpack um, in a moment. Um, but nevertheless, agency as a focus moves us beyond being fed or a subjectivity of a passive, um, you know, um, reliance upon um, an authoritarian state to, to feed us. So I think the focusing on agency as a mechanism for sovereignty and dignity and justice um, is, is a wonderful opening, as is the intergenerational justice justice that's implied with the word sustainability. Um, the critical shifts in policy approaches are very important. Moving food policy as an isolated sector into land and water and labor and migration and other policies, I think is overdue, obviously, as well as moving away from a totalizing global fix to more diverse context specific uh, resolutions. That there is a theory of change section is great. It shows reflexive and generative precedent. Um, and I think it's gonna help us think through the broader kind of power dynamics of even thinking through a global level, high level plan of experts um, set of interventions. Um, I take issue a little bit with um, our kind of fixation on the sustainable development goals number two. Increasingly, there's it's really seen as a limiting discourse and framework. Within this context, it's very important, but I think more pressure to expand the, the SDGs to talk about white supremacism and patriarchy as problems of development and even the very concept of development, taking into account Buen Vivir and other indigenous-led alternatives to development as a paradigm, um, I think is going to be important moving forward. In terms of chapter two, the status quo analysis of policy are failing even on their own terms is a very powerful intervention. But nevertheless, can we think about moving on an apolitical understandings of economics and markets? Um, economics and markets um, have gutted supply management policies, undermined price floors, um, and are really implicated in land tenure concentrations and land grabs. Is it possible to bring in this question of land grabs and undermined price floors in our understanding in the HLP uh, level um, intervention around economic and market um, status quo? In terms of political and institutional um, elements of drivers of food system change, 
Civil strife and conflict is one way of putting it. Militarized oppression is another way, or the prison industrial complex, the counter narcotics industrial complex, and the militarized borders and for-profit detentions, and state-sanctioned brutality against Black communities, Indigenous, undocumented, and poor communities is another way to talk about conflict that actually shows the agent of the conflict rather than just the naturalized state of conflict. Um, in terms of social cultural dimensions, inequalities were called out, which is so important, but going one step further to inequities, um, exploitations and appropriations of labor, the theft and plunder of land and germplasm would be another dimension to think through in terms of the status quo that we're in. Um, there was some discussion of slow progress on women's empowerment. Again, very powerful opening, but going one step further, calling out, following Livia Capacina, gender-based violence, um, se sexist, classist, and racist assaults on reproductive freedoms as markers of food insecurity, and the misogyny that's driving and driven by the authoritarian geopolitical regime that we're finding ourselves in. Again, even the demographics of urbanization, going one step further, what causes urbanization? Largely rural out-migration, which comes from agrarian crises. Um, so kind of thinking that through in terms of declining youth interest, it's not just declining youth interest, the youth aren't interested because it's not a viable livelihood anymore. So kind of there, what got mentioned on page 42 and 65, the need for remunerative prices. But I think I'd love to talk about how kind of expanding the urgency of a fair price for farmers so as to diversify who's able to grow food and who, um, who, who is having that important job. Um, so really thinking through um, how is it possible at this, you know, kind of formal level to get through the deeper long durée of colonialism and coloniality in terms of our understanding of the drivers of our current food system. Um, so just kind of moving forward in terms of the challenges arising from food system drivers, um, there's discussion of weak incentives at producer level, which again would be due to undermining fair prices, um, poverty and precarious livelihoods for, for, for rural people. And again, why don't we just talk about the agrarian crisis that's there. Um, there is also a few um, information about utilization, the quote, lack of access to reliable information on nutrition is a wonderful opportunity to talk about the severed healthy culinary traditions that were severed because of colonialism, coloniality, and racism. So the recovery of indigenous diasporic food traditions um, to kind of move beyond a like behavior shaming food choice um, framework of, of, of why there's malnourishment. Um, and again, thinking through, um, there was some discussion of the HLPE report number one about trade volatility and volatility prices, which was so important, but beyond calming prices, which was the goal on page 46, the secular decline in farm gate prices as such is a problem. Um, and so this is neoliberal trade unchecked and undisrupted. So we need to actually further disrupt trade, you know, in the trade paradigms rather than try to protect them with the status quo. Um, so moving on to um, agency, there's also discussion of uneven access to information and technology. Um, but I would go one step further saying data itself is, is political. So who appropriates the data? Surveillance, corporate profiteering from farmer and field level data. Farmers often say my data is worth more than my crops. Um, so the kind of proprietary intellectual property and closures on germplasm and digital sequence information, um, I think would be key to think through on the next level under undermining of the status quo. Um, so empower is a good verb, but it implies that people haven't been fighting for centuries from the Haitian revolution onward to kind of change land tenure system. So maybe seed power, shift and decentralized power rather than empower vulnerable communities who are vulnerable and marginalized um, is one way of putting it, but they're actually appropriated, exploited and capitalized upon the food system is built on the backs of people who are very central, even though they're kind of technically marginalized. Um, so I guess I'll just kind of um, throw out a few underlying principles that I think can be braided in. Um, the land back movement, um, reparations movement, territorial sovereignty, decolonizing land tenure, um, maybe if more focus on cooperatives, communal land tenure, collective coalitions, it's kind of a broader kind of feminist framework. Um, and then I'll just end by saying, um, this discussion of the right to food um, is dangerous. It's very important, but is there a way to frame it in a way that it's not giving more power to authoritarian heads of state? Um, there's a, many dictators have solidified their power precisely by providing cheap food to the masses. So phrasing food provision as inherently passive could risk emboldening subservience to a patronizing kind of you know, um, nation state overseer. Um, and so kind of thinking through the right to have food without further entrenching a nation state as the dominant scale of reference, I think would be something I'd love to kind of think through with other folks. Um, so I'll just end by saying, um, the two things, how, actually how much time do I have? Probably not much. 
two, two points I want to make just to end with. Um, I'm so inspired by this document, um, but I feel like we need, we could go further, um, in part because this document opened up space and the HLP has opened up space. Um, so decommodifying food following the indigenous lead, I think is something to at least put on the table. To the degree to which we're not there yet, and food is still a commodity, a fair price for growers and supply management is going to be key. Um, and so I just want to throw out disparitytoparity.org. It's a project that I'm working on with a lot of grassroots groups, many in the Via Campesina network, on updating agricultural supply management and farm gate price floors for racial and gender justice and for climate resilient food systems. Um, supply management systems have heretofore really benefited largely white men, commodity crop producers, monocultural production, but they were honest about the uh, capitalist crisis of agriculture. Um, and so it's important to kind of think through how do we update that for diversifying farm Farmers, but also diversifying production systems. Um, and as we were working on this project, then the Indian farmer revolution began, which is the largest peaceful protest in the history of like recorded humanity. Literally, you know, tens of millions of people are on the streets right now arguing for a minimum support price. Um, and so kind of thinking through that as really perhaps a leverage to really shift the entire paradigm of world trade and governance toward nourishing the people who nourish us. Um, and so maybe I will leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Garrett. Great, great comments. Um, we're going to move on to our next discussion, which is uh, discussant, who is Hanson Yantaki Frimpom at the University of Denver. All right. Hello to everyone, and uh, glad to see all of you here on the Zoom. And thanks, Bill, for extending an invitation to me to comment on this report. First of all, I want to stress that I really enjoyed reading it and I want to congratulate you as well as the other co-authors for putting together this beautiful document. What I want to do is to flag five things that I think the report does very well and then I will highlight three issues that perhaps could have been strengthened. So let's start with the, the positive aspect. First of all, in terms of conceptual thinking, I was very happy to see the strong emphasis on agency and sustainability, particularly uh, uh, in the issue of agency links back to issues of food sovereignty and I was very happy to see your, your, your comments on why food sovereignty wasn't specifically in, included in the report but I was very happy to see agency and sustainability in addition to the traditional dimensions of availability, access, utilization and stability. Then the, the second thing I really like about the report is it's, uh, it's rightly acknowledges how today's food system contributes to climate change. Most often we, we hear a lot about how climate affects agriculture, but less on how our agricultural system today influences climate change, primarily based on intensive use of synthetic inputs as well as mechanization. So I was very happy to see the strong connection on how agriculture today is intensifying climate variability and change. Then the, the third thing I really like about the report is its recommendation on context-specific solutions taken into account local knowledge as well as uh, local conditions. Most often, you know, we, we, we see one fit all solutions all over the world and we've seen repeatedly that these solutions don't work. So I was very happy to see the report mentioning consistently that there's a need to focus on context specificity if you want to address food security and then nutrition. Then the fourth, the fourth thing that I really like is the, 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 the section on livestock revolution uh, or what some geographers have termed the mythification of diets or the meat of the global food system. We all know that today we produce a lot of cereals, but most of these go into feeding livestock rather than feeding human beings. So uh, increased meat consumption actually has a lot of implications for food security and nutrition. I was very happy to see the discussion around that topic. And then the final Strong point for me was the, the key emphasis on agroecological farming with the excellent examples that came from Nicaragua, Mexico, and then the Malawian case, which I know very well. So overall, uh, these are five things that stood out strongly for me in terms of things that the report does very well. Now, uh, let's get into where it, co it could have been strengthened. And here I'm going to put my political ecology cap on and then flag some stuff that I think, you know, the, the report could have done well. The first thing is attentiveness to land grabbing, especially in food insecure countries. And I was very happy when uh, Garrett mentioned that. We all know that land grabbing is still ongoing in different parts of the world, and it's highly acute, and especially in, 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 in countries where food insecurity is 
very significant, including Burundi, Ethiopia, Malawi. But the report doesn't put a lot of emphasis on how it, there's some discussion on land tenure systems, but not specifically on land grabbing and its impact on food security and nutrition. It's, there, there is a policy recommendation that we need to promote agroecology, but one of the key things for agroecology to work is, is addressing the issue of land policy. So if, if you have a report that doesn't talk a lot about land grabbing, then it could be problematic in terms of achieving in the food, the agroecology recommendation that is outlined in the last chapter. The second thing for me, you know, it's the report has a tendency of viewing particular social cultural groups as homogeneous. For example, there's constant reference to women and gender, but oftentimes these are groups lumped together. And there's a lot of a lot of feminist geography literature showing that women as a group, you know, it's it's very diverse based on age, marital status, gender, race, and so on. But all the time when there's a reference to women, gender, or indigenous groups, they are often lumped together without any serious effort to acknowledge the differences among these groups. And also there is no mention of intersectional dimensions of inequality. That is how, for example, race, gender, class, and disability all map together to affect food security and nutrition. The report doesn't talk about this at all. And the last point it's, uh, the, and perhaps this is the, the, the major weakness in the report, it's, it's neglect of history. You know, in some parts of the world, especially in Latin America and Africa, you cannot talk about food insecurity without making reference to the colonial process in these regions. And the report makes no reference to the colonial history of, of parts of the world where we have higher levels of food insecurity and undernutrition. There's a beautiful figure uh, in, the, in the paper that is, I think, figure two, that maps out the drivers of food systems change. There is some discussion on, on politics, but no reference to historical context in terms of causes of food insecurity and nutrition. And I think this could have been strengthened uh, if we want to achieve the second sustainable development goals. So thank you. These are my, my comments on the report. Thank you, Hanson, for some excellent comments and insights. And thank you as well for saving us a little bit of time. Uh, we're next going to move to Dr. Jahi Chappelle, who's with the Southeastern African American Farmers Organic Network. Thanks, Bill. Um, yeah, so it's a, a pleasure to join all my colleagues here in commenting on this. Uh, in addition to being at SAFON, I'm also a, a adjunct faculty at Washington State University's State, uh, School of the Environment and at the uh, Center for Agriculture, Water and Resilience in Coventry. Uh, right now I'm located in Durham, North Carolina on uh, Shuckery, uh, Lumbee and Eno land. And being a new resident here, I have a lot to, to learn to go beyond the land acknowledgement and actually learn much more about about the land I'm on. Um, and I, I want to quickly just say it's, it's exciting to be on this uh, panel. Bill has been a big uh, intellectual influence on me over my career, as well as Carl and I see Leslie Gray's in the, the audience here. Um, so for my comments, um, I'm not sure if I'll be overtime or undertime or, or which. So let's see, I, I've, I've got uh, a number of things that I like, that I would like to start with as well, like, like, uh, like Hanson did. Um, a number of things that are more than nitpicks, but, but not major issues. And then I've got a, a set of comments and, and questions that I think are politically unfair to the authors, but that's okay because my other major points are logistically unfair to the authors. Um, so in terms of the things that I really enjoyed, um, I mean, I, I personally, of course, uh, I, I was really like, like Hanson mentioned, very, uh, encouraged and glad to see the focus on agency and sustainability. As Bill says, these ideas are not uh, new. Uh, a lot of agency has um, agency analysis has overlapped with food sovereignty discourse, and I appreciate um, how Bill explained why that choice was, was made. Um, but agency and sustainability are basically the themes of my career, so I was really excited to see that. Um, I was really excited to see the inclusion of a theory of change, uh, though I have some issues with it, but uh, I think it's a really important element to me across sort of space, uh, certainly for movements, but all movements often have, if not an explicit theory of change, at least an implicit one, whereas I feel a lot of uh, researchers and international organizations haven't even thought through their implicit theory of change. There's, there's just an assumption that something will happen and somehow we put this out there. So I appreciate bringing that idea explicitly into the discussion 
uh, definitely, of course, the conclusion that we need radical transformation, uh, the focus on context specificity. I thought that the report did a, a admirable job in trying to speak to that at the same time as being a global report. Uh, very tricky, but I thought it did fairly well. And uh, some of these policies, like in India and Chile, I was less familiar with or hadn't heard of. And so I was glad to see some other examples brought uh, to the fore. And really very happy to see that it didn't treat rural urban mi migration as a law of gravity, as it's so often treated. It just people naturally do that. There's no forces around it. It's just what humans do. And that so often sneaks into the discourse, even of, of care careful scholars. So I really appreciated that. Um, and reframing the right to food as freedom from hunger in all forms of malnutrition, I think also is an important intervention. Uh, so in terms of the politically unfair co uh, comments I had, uh, you know, given their, their positionality and, and the organization that is receiving the report, it's not surprising that it didn't spend a lot of time poking the bear in terms of indicting nation states, uh, indicting, it, it spent some time com coming in corporations, but um, you know, I'm not sure, I probably wouldn't have even gotten through uh, the final process, but at the same time as I uh, appreciate, and think there's value in this report and the shoals it had to navigate to bring us what I think is uh, important insights, it, it also definitely had some, to me, strange lacuna, I mean, particularly around the United States, uh, my country, uh, when it were mentioned things uh, like the uh, uh, summit on world food security five years later, it didn't mention that the United States was a very important dissenting voice to that. Um, mentioning the different treaty and rights obligations that states have taken on, in most cases, the United States has opposed or had reservations about these and said, you know, the progressive realization of the right to food has no international force and should, you know, install and instill no obligations. And so this consistent point of view that there shouldn't be anything that forces us to try and fight hunger, I think is a, pro a uh, important problem to address. And I think that there is a interesting contradiction within the HLPE as it's defined on paper in terms of being evidence-based, but I think compelled by you know, the politics to not really spend a lot of time on the evidence that there are certain actors who have a huge culpability in blocking all the things that um, it, it puts forward. And that felt like a, a little bit of a lacuna in the report in terms of how and who would do these things. Uh, obviously, being of the CFS, it, it's nation state focused, but how do we get nation states to do that? What are the ways that we deal with uh, countries that are in the midst of conflict? What, what, how do we withdraw uh, or how do we change international pressures that often exacerbate those? How do we support, if we're not native to those countries, how do we support forces for positive transformation? Um, I mean, I think some of this goes beyond the scope of the report, but I think some of it also just felt missing to me you know, in terms of having a theory of change, the actual theory of how the changes would happen for policymakers, how that would be uh, uh, enforced or pushed or supported uh, felt a little bit or significantly lacking to me. Um, so that's the, the unfair uh, political critique. Uh, on the logistical side, um, so I have the, the classic armchair reviewer's critique of this is a really good report for the things it did, but why didn't it do three other things I just thought of? Um, and so just one of them in terms of, as it started uh, out talking about uh, reviewing the previous HLP work uh, towards this report, I would have been really interested in a much more explicit investigation of how the HLP reports have uh, uh, evolved. You know, a content analysis, qualitative or quantitative, um, which is kind of not exactly what the report was meant to be about, but it did make me really wonder if you did that analysis of how HLPE itself has evolved over time, what that would show. And there's a, a mention a couple of times of, um, of what HLPE uh, uh, recommendations or ideas have sort of made it into discourse or policy. Uh, an analysis of the effects of HLPE on actual change would have been fascinating, though again, maybe, you know, actually a different report, but it did really make me want that report of, of that connection, um, especially just around, I mean, I think 
it behooves, I think, many of us, but particularly, I think it'd be interesting for the HLPE to grapple with the, the sort of infinite regress question of what's the evidence for the importance of evidence? You know, where is, or, or to be more fair, where is evidence and what kind of evidence the most important for the kinds of changes that we, we want? Uh, what spaces and interventions are most effective? And that, that actually could be a role HLPE could take on without totally politically get going out of bounds is, is the kind of evidence HLPE generates, where is that most useful for whom, when, and, and by whom? And that I think would be a super interesting uh, approach. And that's, oops, come on, stop. So that's uh, my time. I think actually I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Jahi, for raising really interesting and thorny issues. And thank you for respecting the time. I appreciate that. Uh, next, we're going to move on to Joy of Iraq, who's at UC Berkeley. Great. Um, good morning, everyone. Great to be with you today. Thank you, Bill, for inviting me um, to comment and to be with this really incredible panel of colleagues. Um, it's great to be here. So my name is Joey Varrock and my research focuses on the intersections of food sovereignty, international development and agricultural biotechnology on the African continent broadly and within Ghana specifically. And I share this quick introduction to myself because my research interests are mainly what inform the quick remarks that I prepared today. So I'll begin by echoing others that it's exciting to see a high level policy document that acknowledges the complexity of food systems, calls for critical policy shifts and ask stakeholders to move beyond productivity and imagining more holistic and socially just ways of organizing food systems. Um, critical scholars, social movements, and importantly, farmer groups have called for such a launching point for decades. Um, and so to see it uh, be so foregrounded in a venue like this is very much welcomed. So when reading the report, one of the things that caught my eye as many other people have been commenting on so far is the use of agency. Um, and particularly SEND's concept of agency as both a conceptual and policy framework. And this caught my eye for a few reasons. The first is that it signaled, at least to me, an elephant in the room, and Bill acknowledged that in his introduction. And that elephant is that the definition of food security that the report uses with its emphasis on agency and sustainability is very similar to the framework of food sovereignty. Now, when you read the report, you'll, no you'll, you'll notice that food sovereignty is not mentioned. Um, and Bill has provided us with um, a background of why, and I appreciate that. But I'll just spend a few moments saying that I was surprised by that, given that the report calls for, quote, radical transformation of food systems theory and practice. And given the large space that food sovereignty not only holds in academic debates, but especially within social movements, and Garrett um, mentioned that uh, briefly. So um, I think this is worth acknowledging and pondering as a group. And I understand that this term is, is politicized, um, controversial, but it seems to me that there are many other potentially controversial items that are mentioned in this report, such as corporate concentration and financialization, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd be curious to learn more about how the panel debated and compromised around these sort of sticky, thorny issues. Um, the second reason that agency caught my eye is because I was partially trained in linguistic anthropology and critical discourse analysis two disciplines that are very interested in agency and specifically agency as it relates to power. And within these fields, and of course, there's always gonna be disagreement here, but within these fields, there's one line of argumentation that contends that agency is not synonymous with free will or as freedom as Sen might contend, but rather to quote Laura Ahorn, uh, Ahern, excuse me, agency is a socio-cultural mediated capacity to act, or in other words, something that is constituted not only by norms and practices, but also by institutions and discourses and shaped by social structures. Now at, at risk of getting too in the weeds, I bring this up because I think this sort of definition differs significantly from the freedom-centered Senian framework that is used in the report. And what a more critical take on agency might offer those of us who are interested in this report and are interested in agency as it relates to food systems is power or at least the insistence on asking what sort of institutions and social structures shape people's ability to act and shape their actions as well. And I think this is important because a theory of agency that is concerned with power lends itself, at least in my opinion, to theorization that's more grounded in a political economic um, or a political ecological praxis. And so to that end, I would say that one of the strengths of this report, in my opinion, is that it identifies and scrutinizes a number of processes, forces, 
and actors that institutionalize and replicate inequalities and inequities within the food systems. With that said, and with a critical eye, I do think a core actor is missing from this report's focus, and that is the development industry. And while the report references donor assistance and foundations vaguely, I would argue that these groups deserve greater scrutiny. And that is because the development industry plays a key role in upholding some of the very things that this report argues are exacerbating food and nutritional inequalities. For instance, we know that development finance, whether it's derived from public institutions or private foundations, is a key component of larger financialization trends, including private equity schemes and agricultural sectors. And for instance, we know that the same food and agricultural corporations that are hyper concentrated and one might even say hold near monopolies um, receive large contracts and partnerships from development actors. So multiple mega food security projects on the African continent from the New Green Revolution to Feed the Future to the G8 New Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition rely or relied on working hand in hand with mega industry players like Monsanto, now Bayer, Hershey's and Cargo. And while we're on the topic of industry, page 33 of the report expresses concerns over industry lobbying governments to quote, influence regulatory processes or regulatory requirements across food systems. Um, and this is a rightful and important point of contention um, in the report. But we also know that certain development actors do this too, including lobbying for things like intellectual property rights and advocating for decreased public sector spending two additional items that the report is rightfully, again, concerned with. So for instance, the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa has an entire policy node dedicated to lobbying for particular legislative outcomes, including intellectual property rights and liberalization schemes, um, saying nothing of some of the more uh, publicly, uh, sorry, saying nothing of the uh, organizations that are developed directly by funders like USAID to do similar types of work. So these are just a few examples of how the development industry vastly shapes food systems and aids in its inequalities. And I understand that, uh, again, this might be a, a polit politically thorny thing um, to, to follow Jahi. And I understand that a, a report like this can't cover any, everything. And that one, of a purpose, one purpose of a report is to spur reflection across mul multiple stakeholders, including those within the development industry. And indeed, this report and its foundational argument, or one of its foundational arguments, that hunger is increasing and that radical changes are needed, should spur some tough questions for those within the development apparatus. If hunger is indeed increasing after 50 plus years of development interventions, what does that mean for the industry? And what kind of policy-oriented questions could development professionals be asking themselves about the roles they play, the interventions they design, the partnerships they pursue, and the ideologies and platforms they replicate. So I'll conclude by saying that I've focused on the development industry and agency as a political economic critique today, because I think that for those of us who are interested in radically changing food systems, it's important to use this sort of space to talk about the wide gamut of actors from farmers, to state bodies, to social movements, to industry, to private equity funds, and everyone outside and in between um, that shape the food systems we live in today and will live in in the future. So I'll end my comments here and um, thank you again. Thank you so much, Sueva, for your insightful and thoughtful comments. Uh, next, we have uh, Carl Zimmer at Penn State University. Thanks. Um, and it's great to, great to be here and to see everyone. Thanks uh, very much, Bill, for the invitation and opportunity and um, thanks to, uh, to each of the, the presenters and panelists for, for their discussions. And so as, as things have unfolded, I've been um, narrowing my comments to a slightly sh shorter and, and uh, potentially more uh, distinct list since, since the original version has various, various areas of overlap. And, and I, I characterize all of these as very uh, constructive and, and positively uh, engaged kinds of, of points that are um, intended to uh, potentially find a kind of uh, middle space uh, between the report and where it's coming from and uh, what some of the, the um, 
maybe the science as well as the scholarship or, and uh, politics around these issues would uh, would also suggest as uh, as areas of maybe challenge and, and opportunity. So the first, and for me, the, <clears throat> the area of uh, terrible, terrible metaphor here, but uh, you know, the low hanging fruit on this report that just sort of baffles me a little bit is the role of nutrition, um, which in some ways is, is obvious. It's in the title of the report. It's the benchmark for the report is malnourishment uh, global malnourishment data, and yet it has a way of uh, kind of slipping in and out of view, and and to kind of quit at least in in my my reading and to to quickly synopsize this, I, I have turned my attention to page ten in the report, which is this really important diagram outlining the the six approaches to food security. The, the six uh, six main elements and um, and in there in that that's kind of in my mind the conceptual framework for much of the report and and in there the the element of, of nutrition slips to being a subset of of utilization which is which is one of these six thematic areas and um, and I'm raising this because, I, I, to me, the, the concept of nutrition broadly defined, not in any kind of reductionist sense, although though also in very specific ways related to, to health and well-being, uh, actually intersects powerfully with, with all of the other issues involving access and availability and sustainability and stability. I mean, agroecology and agrobiodiversity studies have told us a lot about how nutritionally diverse landscapes and uh, access to nutri nutritionally diverse foods are, are really cornerstones of, of what the report is, is, is getting at. And so I think my, my point here in a way is that I felt like the the, the potential to use nutrition as a lever or a fulcrum far more fully than, than actually occurs is, is um, was, was a little bit of a, uh, well, it was a surprise. And, and um, you know, I, I would reference, or all kinds of works coming out of all kinds of, of great projects, including many by people in today's group are, are contributing to this and and um, the the but again the point is to highlight the the intersections between the nutrition dimension and and these key elements and the the uh, kind of rhetorical and uh, organizational slippage that occurs in the in the report from going. From having been part of the title to like being a uh, really discrete subset of the of the main kind of conceptual framework that's presented, and I could unpack that further, but that's that's a general point. Again, I see this as like a, a middle space sort of engagement with with the report. Uh, a second example of this. Um, I guess for, for me and for, uh, I mean, this is reflecting projects that I'm actively <clears throat> engaged in. And one, uh, a second point would be the, um, the, the, the reports treatment of um, kind of bigger trends and urbanization and urban rural interfaces in particular. And I, I really liked, um, Jahi's point that this is not like some gravity model predestined uh, version of rural urban migrations. And, and that's, that's great. That's a major step forward. But I, I do think that, that there is uh, such a thing as, as uh, on the one hand, kind of planetary urbanization, whereby all of these rural spaces are being affected by 
urban influences. And on the other hand, just these incredibly fluid kinds of interactions. And, and last summer we did, <clears throat> did a number of um, cell phone based um, interviews with, uh, it, it, this was done in collaboration with a bunch of people in South America. And it was all about this kind of urban to rural exodus that was uh, the informal sector uh, kind of uh, reacting and responding to extreme food insecurity. And, um, you know, th this, it's not ex at all un unprecedented. And again, it underscores the 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 urban rural fluidity and rights to the city but also rights to rural spaces as having become similarly important and so i'd, I'd want to suggest this kind of non-teleological perspective that that jahi was mentioning and others i mean i just think that 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 has a lot in it for the current and future uh context of of food security and um, and nutrition security, of 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 course. Um, I mean, it, this third point is it's kind of a minor one, but but maybe not. And it's it's a critical reading of what urbanization means for food quality and for food security. And and the report tends to adopt this particular reading that that urbanization is uh, exclusively or, or nearly exclusively uh, represented by this uh, simplification and standardization of, of, of diets and um, and dietary patterns associated with what uh, I'm, I'm fairly certain the report uses Popkin's sort of fourth uh, it, it, it uses Popkin's model and it infers, the fourth phase of simplification and homogenization. And, 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 and I think that's the way the interpretation usually works. But, but there's another way of reading Popkin's ideas that actually sees uh, uh, the fifth phase uh, in that, or fifth pattern in that, in that framework, opening up kind of counter currents and counter um, possibilities to homogenization and dietary simplification, food, food and nutritional insecurity um, being kind of countered. And that's, um, that's the less common element. And yes, I think it'd be kind of interesting. And I may be similarly trying to find this middle space would be on international trade and um, Jennifer Clapp, another co-author of the report's done tremendous work on this. And one of the interesting things to me here is that while international trade and globalization have tended to dominate some of this discussion, about 80% of food supply in most countries continues to be domestic and national. So how to kind of uh, reconcile global supply chains and those, those roles in food security with um, these, uh, these national ones that have their own, uh, th th their own pressures and their own pitfalls, but potentially their, their own opportunities as well, I think needs to, to, to get elevated above this sort of general discourse on globalization that can can tend to occur in these in these reports. Anyway, I think I made that about four comments. And uh, yeah, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Carl, for those insights. And last but not least, we have Brian Dowd Uribe from the University of San Francisco. Hi, everyone. Um, and thank you, Bill, for the invitation um, to be with this really esteemed group of colleagues who I admire um, immensely, really. Um, and to echo Jahi's comments, Bill, you've, you've also been someone whose work has heavily influenced mine. So just grateful to be in conversation with you about this report. And also very um, happy to see that you're on this committee. Um, and I just kind of want to acknowledge that and, and just say that it's because of the great work that you've done. And I'm just really happy that that's been noticed and that 
and that you're you're doing this work and you're on that committee doing this work. Um, so I'm Brian Dowd Uribe. I'm assist, associate professor. I guess I'm not assistant anymore. Um, associate professor um, at the University of San Francisco. And um, as the, the the last discussant to go, I'm you know I have to throw out my entire script. Um, I should I should have known this ahead of time, um, given the, the the folks who were preceding me. So I'm just going to go off script and try to keep this as brief as possible. Um, I'm trying to see this report in in the context of other narratives that kind of circulate and also in kind of the historical um, nature of these kinds of reports. So what are the other reports out there? When were they published? What did they say? Um, and then also what are these other narratives and how does this position itself vis-a-vis -vis some of these narratives? Um, and I think this connects to one of Jahi's comments about this idea of a content analysis. And so I think Jahi was speaking specifically to some of the HLPE reports and then how this report kind of riffs off of or builds from or not um, some of these earlier reports. And I think we could also perhaps extend that idea to some of the other global reports that have been out there um, being produced by other organizations to understand um, whether and how there are differences and where those differences are and how that can be an explanatory tool for both um, understanding what, you know, this report in a context, but also, um, you know, understanding a whole suite of other things. Um, this report is going to be lots of things to lots of people, um, and it should be. Every report is multiple things at once, and so I don't want to um, slide into this du duality thinking of, you know, bad, good, um, you know, does this, does, doesn't do that. Um, it does lots of things, um, and it's important for us to see those things in a, in a particular context. I think it's important to see that when things become repeated over historical reports, that can be an area that deserves greater attention. And so I'm thinking specifically to the IAASTD report, which seems to just have been lost you know, on the radar, so to speak. But I do see um, things that are being... Um, you know, tunes or chords that are being uh, played again that I can see on that report. Um, but that report was, I believe, published in 2008 and we're in 2021. So this could also provide an opportunity to say, why are we saying some of the same things? Um, why aren't things proceeding in a certain ways? And so, you know, and I think that this needs to be seen in that sort of a context. Um, you know, what is possible with this report? I think we're walking and dancing around that question. I think, you know, if we start from the starting point of the HLPE and the CFS should remain legitimate institutions, and we want them to remain legitimate institutions, notwithstanding the problematic power terms around legitimacy, who are you legitimate to, so for example. Um, but if we want to re retain that legitimacy, you know, I, th I think one of the questions we're dancing around here is, you know, what is possible? What kind of narrative can be produced here that pushes the conversation forward, enables particular um, radical transformation, so to speak, um, while also perhaps retaining this legitimacy? And I don't think that that's, uh, it's clearly not an easy task. Um, and, you know, in that vein, I think this report um, you know, some of my colleagues have, have, have highlighted, I think, some areas where it could have expanded upon. So saying that there were opportunities here that are present, I think race and racism being the, the foremost of them. And I was grateful that Garrett um, centered that in her comments um, for not just the, uh, for the very good reasons that Garrett raised in terms of the global profile of the Black Lives Matter movement, but also just the, the sheer volume of the scholarship um, that's emerging. Um, if we're going to center this as an expertise or science science based report, let's let's dredge up some of that scholarship on race. Let's get that integrated into this report. I think that's one area that I think could still maneuver the complicated political dynamics while also um, highlighting um, particular structural features that are that are notably absent um, in parts of the report. Um, you know, Garrett also brought up this idea of militarization and conflict, and I'm also wondering, um, I'm wondering whether that's also a, a space that can be further elaborated here, um, particularly given the theme of interconnectivity. Um, and, 
particularly given that militarization and conflict is a primary driver of hunger, um, I'm, I'm wondering whether the report can take a more strident position um, given its own particular context around issues of militarization. Um, namely because I think it's the, many of the political, economic, or power drivers around those um, lie outside of the committee composition um, and yet can be focused, and this could be an opportunity to focus on militarization as an area um, and give that kind of a higher profile. I was very pleased to see the comments on agency by Joeva, who, you know, uh, hit a grand slam, I think, with that term um, and situating it properly. I was, uh, one of the questions I was having as seeing, you know, agency centered was, I'm so happy it's there. Um, and I'm also so worried that it's going to become, um, you know, the new participation or something of that sort, which um, doesn't serve the purpose that it ostensibly is, is, is there to serve, right? Um, and that's why I think others had, had raised issues around the, the lack of, um, I guess, focus on issues of power or the term power or the term sovereignty, both of which power does show up, particularly in chapter two on the economic and market, um, you know, section, subsection. Um, but it doesn't, it's not a centered term and it's not, it's relatively um, not given um, much space. Um, to, I, am I over time, Bill? You have about a minute left, Brian. Okay. Well, if I got it just a minute, um, I think I wanted to loop back to the other narratives out there, but um, I think it's kind of silent on many of the divisions between kind of an agroecological food sovereignty narrative and kind of the sustainable intensification narrative. Um, and I'm, and I would love to learn a bit more about how that process happened at the committee level, because one way of seeing that, and I'm not sure that this is the right way, is that particularly given in the context of the HLPE number 14 report, which did center agroecology, um, is this kind of a, a step away from the centering of agroecology at the level of the CF, uh, CFS, or you know, just to learn more about um, some of those dynamics. So thank you, um, and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you uh, very much, Brian, for batting cleanup. Um, really insightful comments. So uh, we have a little bit of time here for general discussion. Um, I can't see everyone on my um, screen. So uh, under reactions, if you raise your hand, um, uh, I'll call on people um, in the order that, that, that they would like to make a comment or ask a question of the panelists. Just, just to get us started, Leslie Gray did raise a question in the um, chat about the World Food Summit and how she'd like to hear more about that and the controversy surrounding it. Um, I can give you a thumbnail sketch, but I'd love to hear what others think. I think, you know, uh, Agnes Kilabata is the chair. Um, she's uh, uh, also the head of uh, AGRA, the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. And, so, and there's concern about sort of who's setting the agenda um, uh, and sort of the role that civil society is playing in, in, in sort of setting the agenda and contributing. And I think concerns about some people being brought in and co-opted um, rather than having a sort of real substantial role. Uh, I think personally, there's a concern that out of this might come a proposal for an institution, uh, sort of an IPCC of food security that would supplant the CFS and the HLPE. And I, it's not perfect, but I really like how CFS tries to bring in multiple stakeholders. And I'm concerned that any type of new institution might not be as participatory as the existing one. Other questions or comments? Bill, would you mind maybe expanding a bit on that in terms of the politics around that um, in the CFS and the HLPE vis-a-vis -vis the creation of this new institution? Is that something that's discussed by colleagues 
are, are they are they actively working against it for it you know th those sorts of things i mean the world food summit is sort of a well i think it's important that uh we're drawing attention to this issue in a un forum but it's a it's sort of a parallel process. It, the CFS is not in the driver's seat here. Um, and um, early on, they didn't even have a role in, um, well, actually they still don't have a central role in sort of setting, setting the agenda. And I just know that this is one potential outcome of the summit and yeah. I've shared my concern about that. Other questions or comments? And again, raise a virtual hand, please, if you'd like to share something or if any of the other panelists would like to share. Yeah, Jahi. Yeah, so I, I, um, I uh, uh, want to, respect that you're saying you know, you're not here to, de to defend the report, but I, I would love to hear, um, I mean, I'd love to hear your, your general uh, uh, thoughts on, on what was said, but um, actually I'm very specifically interested as well in terms of your thoughts on the envelope of political possibility within this report. And, um, you know, I'm not sure how much, you know, you're allowed to or meant to speak to, but just in terms of, I think it's important what it's put forward. I think we all, that all the panelists did. And, um, you know, there are also some provocation for where maybe even in the political circumstances could have gone further. And I'm, I'm very curious about your, your thoughts on those. Yeah, so, I mean, there's a range of scientists on the HLPE. There are 15 of us. And so there are agronomists, agroeconomists, nutritionists, geographers um, and for lack of a better term, some of us, some on the committee have a more sort of conventional thought process about uh, agriculture and nutrition and others a more expansive or progressive view. So there's, I mean, <laughs> there are a lot of compromises that need to be made. Um, I referenced food sovereignty in the beginning. We made, a strategic decision, the authors, our concern was that if we connected agency to food sovereignty, we'd lose the whole thing. And so we went with agency because we thought it had a better chance of getting through and it, and it did. So I'm grateful for that. Um, so ideally what happens is these reports, um, they're sort of debated in the CFS. And ideally you then have a policy stream and that hasn't happened yet, which comes up with a set of recommendations, which then get filtered down to member states. And so obviously the UN has no real power. All it has is sort of discursive power, but the, the hope in an ideal world, some of this would be adopted by CFS and the other Rome-based agencies. And, uh, you know, this would make it into ministries of agriculture and nutrition, health, you know, uh, around the world. That's, that's sort of the best case scenario. I don't, I don't know if that answers your question, Jahi. I mean, we don't have to belabor it, but yeah, I, I guess I, I was curious if there were any spaces where you feel like with the reflection of the panelists that maybe things could have been uh, pushed a little bit more within the constraints that you're, you're operating or, or I guess if you feel like this is the, was the maximally, it were, yeah, the, if the, the further comments have brought to mind anything where you think there could have been further space. <laughs> I'll, uh, it's a collaborative process. And if it were just me writing the report, or just the author team, it would look different than what them was uh, what was ultimately shared. Yeah, Sierra, you have a question or comment? Yeah, I guess um, just trying to 
think about the processes in which how decisions around the report were made, uh, building off of the previous comment. I'm wondering if you can describe about how agroecology was come about and used in the report because uh, it's something that I've been pushing for within uh, Global Affairs Canada. I'm based in, in Toronto at the University of Waterloo. And at that donor landscape anyway, no one's really willing to have a conversation on the food system team around agroecology because of the politics around uh, around participation and, and the types of farmers involved in these processes. So um, I'm wondering if we can speak a little bit about that. Sure, so that's a great comment. Um, so this was HLPE report number 15. The previous one, number 14, was focused on agroecology. Um, which I think is actually kind of remarkable that we had a whole UN report focused on agroecology. And I was actually quite pleased that as much agroecology, <laughs> I felt like we got as much agroecology into this report as possible. And I was, and I was pretty happy about that. Um, it's, I feel, well, this is probably naively optimistic, but I feel like agroecology is slowly but surely becoming slightly more mainstream and it's not quite as marginalized as it used to be. And it's, I think within the UN, it's getting more airtime than it, than it used to. And this is one uh, sort of marker of that. So I'm conscious of time. Uh, we are at uh, our limit here. I really um, thank you so much to a great panel. I really appreciated um, all of your sort of useful feedback and comments. Um, and uh, my understanding is that this, the AAG is recording this, so um, there'll be a record of it. Um, and thank you to a wonderful audience for showing up and uh, raising questions. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, and Bill, thank you for organizing it and setting a precedent to having these kind of high level panel reports be thought about collectively in these, in these forums. Thank you. Thanks, Garrett. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for, for all beating me into, into coming, Bill. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Jahi. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Bill, so much gratitude. Carl Hansen, mm -hmm. Brian. Bye-bye everyone.